king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I, I wonder, do you know him? <laughs> my king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a well-framed of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His reign is righteous, and his yoke is easy, and his burden is lighter. I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your head. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees. They found out they couldn't stop him. Tyler couldn't find any fault in him. Terror couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the grave couldn't hold him. Good morning, church. Happy Easter. He is risen. Would you please stand? We're going to worship this morning and celebrate. Oh, 
Father, you are so worthy. We are so grateful for your sacrifice, Jesus, for us. We were the ones that deserved to die on that cross, Lord, but you did it for us because you love us that much. And then you did the miraculous. You rose again on the third day, which is why we celebrate today. God can do miracles. Our God is so powerful. And you love us with such a powerful love. That's the good news that we want to proclaim this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. In your name we pray. And all the people said, amen. Good morning, church. Before you have a seat, could you please welcome the people around you? Say hi. Happy Easter. Okay, if you could find your seats, that would be wonderful. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. How are we this morning? 
I don't know about you, but I feel like I worked out just watching Mike up here on stage. I don't know about you, but <laughs> worship team did an amazing job. They do an amazing job every Sunday, but I just, what a gift. What a gift to all of us. My name is Dwayne. For those of you who don't know me, and I want to thank you for being here this morning. Our ushers on the fr are in the front of the room, and we're going to pass the buckets. Thank you for giving your his tithes and your offerings, Lord, to the Lord. I'm sorry if I could talk this morning. I'm, I'll choked up from this morning. Um, so thank you for being here. If you're a first-time guest, thank you so much for being here with us. We're honored that you chose to join us this morning. Um, in your bulletin, when you, when you came in, you received this little card inside. If you're a first-time guest, if you would fill this out, just let us knowing that, letting us know that you're here with us this morning, that would be wonderful. Also on the back of that card is a little area for prayer requests. If you have any prayer requests that you'd like the team to come along, alongside you and pray with you and for you. If you would fill that out and just drop it in the buckets in the back, that would be wonderful. Again, if you are a first-time guest, we also have a special gift for you out in the lobby. So please stop at the kiosk out in the lobby, and we'd just like to give you a bag just to say thank you for being here this morning. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to the video that's going to introduce our sermon this morning. Thank you for being here. It was early morning, still dusk out. The sun hadn't peeked through the darkness yet. The horror of the events that happened on Friday still lingered in the air. He was supposed to be the one. He was going to be the promised Messiah. He was going to change the world. Despite the trauma of Friday, the world kept spinning. The birds were chirping in the garden as they wakened up from their, mor their evening slumber. The wind gave a gentle breeze. Life just kept happening. Imagine with me for just a moment this morning if, if, if you were there, if what you would have felt you gave up three years of your life. You traveled with Jesus. You listened to all of his sermons. You watched him heal people and set people free. You witnessed all 
the miracles. You believed he truly was the Messiah. Only you thought that his role was to save you from an oppressive government. You didn't understand that there was so much more at stake. Jesus had often talked about the fact that he was going to die. He gave you hints, should I say Easter eggs or spoilers. You just didn't get it. You didn't understand. You were more concerned about where do I get to sit when I go to heaven? What's my future going to be like? You didn't comprehend that you were truly walking beside the Son of God for three years. You were blind to the reality of what was going to happen. Even though he told you, Mark records this, it says they left that place and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know where they were because he was teaching his disciples. He said to them, the son of man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him. And after three days, he will rise. But they didn't understand what he meant, and they were afraid to ask. Matthew says the same thing, only it says that they were filled with grief. Jesus himself said, I told you this so you would believe. Yet it was clear. They didn't get it. Jesus was stating, I'm going to die. Three days later, I'm going to come back to life. It's kind of like when you go on a vacation and you have kids. And you tell the kids, okay, we're going to go to this destination and here is the itinerary. And this is what we're going to do on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. This is exactly what we're going to do. And I need you to pack this. And then it comes to the day of the vacation and they're like, what are we doing? (laughs) I didn't know I was supposed to pack my swimsuit. You never told me. You see, they're, they're, the disciples were just like kids. They, they, they were listening. They knew something was going to happen, but they didn't fully comprehend it. The disciples were just everyday, ordinary people, people who had regular lives before giving up everything to follow Jesus. They followed him day and night. And there were others that traveled with him, many others, and we often miss it. We just skim over that part when we read the text. Luke 8 says, After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Cusa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna, and many others. The women were helping to support them out of their own means. I honestly don't know how I missed this part of the Bible, this part of the gospel story. I am very confident that the Sunday after I was born, I was in church. I have been to church my whole life. I could have actually been born in a pew. I'll have to ask my mom. I knew that there was 12 men that followed Jesus. All the paintings kind of portray that, right? I missed the fact that there were many other people traveling with him, including some women. Women who were just ordinary women. Women who had an encounter with Jesus. He had set them free. He had healed them. And so they were so devoted to him because of this. They were tenacious. They were courageous. If you have experienced Jesus in this way, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You know what it's like to be set free, to be healed. And you know what it's like to give everything up to follow Jesus and to make him known to others. Some of these women were very high status women. Joanna, for instance, she was married to a very, very powerful man. They, they had a desire to fully support the ministry of Jesus. It says in the text that they, they supported the ministry out of their own means. Other translations say out of their substance. One of these women was Mary Magdalene. She had traveled with Jesus after he set her free. She was so close that she knew what his voice sounded like. She had an up close encounter to his death and resurrection. And this Easter Sunday, we are going to view the story through her lens. 
Mary Magdalene has had a lot of mis misconceptions about her. It all started around the year 500 when a priest gave a sermon and he called her a prostitute. We actually don't have any evidence that that was true. Scholars state that the most we can know that is true about Mary is that she was probably single and, and there's probably a good reason to believe that her parents had passed. It, the, the, the reason is, is because her name was Mary Magdalene. There's no attachment to anybody else. In that culture, Mary was a very, very common name. And so you would often have, women would often have something else ta attached to their name. So it would be Mary, the wife of her husband, or Mary, the mother of her eldest son, or Mary, the daughter of her parents. And yet she is just called Mary Magdalene, meaning Mary who is from Magdala, a very wealthy fishing village close to Galilee. We do know that Mary had a significant amount of wealth. We just don't know where it came from. It could have been an inheritance. We don't know. We also know that she had seven demons. We don't know why. We just know that Jesus set her free. We don't have a record of what she was like before, the, before Jesus. We just know that she must have been a mess. Seven is the number for completion. So she must have been completely just full of demons. She must have been completely full. We just get to learn about her after her freedom. And there, there's something we need to know about this. If she was completely full of demons, we can know that there is nothing too powerful that Jesus can't break off of you. There are no chains too strong that Jesus can't break off of you. You are not too far gone. Jesus can set you free. Somebody needs to know this morning that you are not your backstory, just like Mary is not her backstory. Her backstory is her testimony. You are who Jesus says you are, and he says you are free. You are free. Mary experienced this gift of freedom, and because of it, she was Jesus' most devoted follower. Jesus even told most of his followers, there's going to come a time. I'm going to be taken away. You're going to desert me, but not Mary. She was there the whole time. She heard all his teachings. She saw his miracles. She watched him be arrested and then sentenced. She saw him carrying the cross for as long as he could. She watched the beatings she was close enough to hear the nails being driven into his wrists and ankles. She heard them mock Jesus. She knew the insults they said. She watched them spit on her Lord. She stayed though. She stayed the entire time. She heard him utter his last words, and then breathe his last breath. And yet she stayed. She stayed. Come with me to John as he records what happened. John 19. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his own cross. He went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him and with two others, one on each side, Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened it to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but write this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them in four shares, one for each of them with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who gets it. This happened so that scripture might be fulfilled that said they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. 
Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother Mary, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. All four of our Gospels have these women here close enough to witness everything. They could hear it. They could feel it. They could sense all of it. They could even smell it. Can you imagine just a moment the terror that they must have felt? The, the heartache, the desperation. You're utterly helpless to do anything. You just have to watch. You maybe remember the prophecies that were spoken centuries and centuries ago about this very day. You heard all of Jesus' teachings. You, you heard him talk about this, and yet you don't understand. You just know that crucifixions have been used by the Roman government as a torture device for a while. Maybe you even know other people who lost their loved ones this way. You just, it's horrific. It's, it's traumatizing the way they brutally treated Jesus. He was whipped with a lead-tipped whip. He was beaten with rods and reeds, a crown of thorn was pl- thorns was placed on his head and pushed in so it pierced his very skull. The swelling, the bruising, the bleeding had to make him completely unrecognizable. Their minds couldn't logically think. They couldn't connect the prophecy to Jesus' teaching. All they knew was Jesus who had set them free, Jesus who had healed them, Jesus who had did all the miracles, all the miracles, Jesus who loved them, loved them deeply, and they loved him. Jesus was on the cross, and he was dying, and they couldn't stop it, and so they stayed. They stayed until he breathed his last breath, saying, it is finished. It was dark. The earth quaked. The curtain tore from top to bottom. And they stayed. The whole world shattered. I know Mary watched Joseph of Arimathea ask for the body. I'm fairly confident she watched them take the lifeless body off the cross. I'm guessing that she probably helped prepare the body with spices for the tomb. She had to have been there when the stone was rolled into place. She wasn't from there after all. She was from Magdala, and yet she knew where to go in the darkness of the morning after the Sabbath was complete. John 20 Starting at verse 1, says, Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. In some of the other Gospels, it talks about how other women were with her. They were coming to bring spices, to to put more spices on Jesus' body. This would probably be needed because Jesus had died right before their Sabbath had started. They would have had to rush to get his body off the cross, rush to get his body prepared with spices, rush to get him to the tomb because Sabbath started at 6 p.m. that same day. Mary, though, a devoted follower of Jesus, wanted to give her Lord a proper burial. But when she came to the tomb, it was already opened. I wonder, what was she thinking Verse 2 says she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. You have to love that they were running. If you were here last Sunday, you know that men didn't didn't run in that culture. They didn't run at all, and yet here Peter and John are running for the tomb. Can you imagine what they're thinking? It's probably fear. It's probably doubt. They probably didn't believe Mary. They, maybe they were angry. Maybe there was a glimmer of hope. 
Verse 5, he being John bent over and looked in at the stripes of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. You have to love John. He always refers to himself in his gospel as the other disciple or the one that Jesus loved. And you have to love that he points out the fact that he got there first. He got there first. I was fastest. He was young. And there's, there's a good chance that there's two reasons he might not have wanted to go in that tomb first. One is maybe he just didn't know if there was a dead body in there. And if you, if you were around a dead body in that culture, you would kind of make yourself unclean. So that could have been his rationale. Or maybe he was just scared. Maybe he just didn't dare go in. But you got to wonder. Simon, Peter, and John are walking back to where they were staying. What was that conversation like? It says they believed, but they didn't understand. Was it that they just finally believed like Mary? Like, yep, body's gone. Body's gone. I don't know what it was that they talked about. It says in verse 11, now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over. She looked into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus's body had been, one at the head, the other at the foot. We have to pause here before I read more because this is such a beautiful image. If you were here on Friday, you know that there's a place called the Holy of Holies in the temple. In that curtain tore, but inside that holy of holies was the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat where God himself would come and sit. And on each side of that seat, each side of that bench was an angel. And here where Jesus was laid on the bench in the tomb, there's an angel at the head and at the foot. I have chills. It's the most beautiful thing ever. Verse 13, they asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord. They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir. Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him. I will get him. So many people ask me as a pastor, how is it that Mary didn't recognize it was Jesus? I mean, she spent all that time with him. He set her free. How is it that she didn't know? But in all honesty, it makes complete sense to me. If you've ever gone through anything traumatic, especially a traumatic loss, you are not thinking that the loved one that you lost is going to be standing there talking to you. That's the last thing your logical brain is thinking. Uh, Additionally, we know that Jesus was beaten. He was pulverized beyond recognition. Mary's last image of Jesus was, was a dead, lifeless body that she cleaned up that she put spices on. She didn't see a healed Jesus. The image of a restored Jesus was not the image in her brain. She was just filled with grief and with trauma. That's what she was holding on to. Even if she had been able to recall some of the things that he had said, she couldn't go there. She couldn't go there. She couldn't comprehend that Jesus had returned from death to life. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Oh, but his voice, his voice, the way he said her name and her eyes are open wide 
I wonder if she flashed back to that time when he healed her, when he set her free from the seven demons and he said her name for the first time. And the, she heard it, Mary, as a healed, whole, restored person. Did she go back there? Suddenly, Mary, she's the first person to see the Lord, to hear his voice, to witness his resurrection. She gets to talk to him. Jesus said in verse 17, do not hold on to me for I have yet, I have not yet ascended to the father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Jesus had a couple things he had to do. And his plan was that he was going to go ahead of them to Galilee and meet him, beat them there. But he needed to get them that message first, the good news, the fact that he had risen from the dead, that he, that, that he was delivered. And so he asked Mary to give the message. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her, Mary, Mary, a woman with a past, a woman who had seven demons, likely a very awful life. He forever changed her. He set her free. He healed her. So she devoted herself to his ministry. She supported his ministry. She learned from him. She cared for him in life and in death. Mary a person with a broken past, a person who people wouldn't normally have regard for her testimony, became the very first person to preach the good news. He is risen. He is risen indeed. She is thought of as the first evangelist post-resurrection, the apostle to the apostles. Her redemption story is priceless. How Jesus called her out of all people to be the one to share the good news. It's beautiful. Over the next 40 days, Jesus would appear to many people. He would perform many more miracles and he would encourage those to keep the faith. John tells us in, in chapter 21, he says, this is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that not even the whole world would have enough room to contain the books that would be written. Oh, John wants you to know, you guys, I tell the truth and I have witnessed it. I have witnessed it. He wants you to know there is so much more to this story about Jesus. There is so much more than we can imagine. You don't want to miss it. You want to witness it. If, 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 if you want to, you just have to believe. You just have to believe you're going to get to hear the whole story in eternity. You're going to get the whole story. Here's what I believe we can pull from the Easter story. This is what I, I think we can, we can learn from it. I think we can learn that life is going to be hard. We are going to have struggles. There is going to be suffering on earth. We can count on it. But there is no struggle. There is no difficulty. There is no hardship that Jesus will not take to the cross for you. We can count on the fact that there are going to be people who reject the good news. There are going to be people who reject Jesus. There are going to be people who mock you for believing in Jesus. They're going to hurl insults at you. Despite the historical accuracy, despite the many eyewitnesses, despite the fact that there are other sources of literature that talk about Jesus, there are still going to be people who reject him. We can count on that. We can count on having times in our lives where it feels like Jesus is just not close. All seems lost. All seems hopeless. We're afraid. Maybe we even have doubt or perhaps because we don't sense his presence, we're just going through the motions. We come to church, maybe say a little prayer, maybe read a Bible verse. He just seems far away. There will be those times. You can count on it. It will be hard, but if you keep showing up, 
If you keep staying near to him, you can also count on him breaking through when you least expect it. He will show up. He will restore your hope. Keep those eyes open. Keep them open, and he will one day call you by your name, and you will recognize him. You might feel fear and joy all wrapped into one, just like Mary did, but he will show up. And here's a promise. Here's a promise that you can take to the bank. The suffering that we have on this earth will be nothing compared to the glory that you will have in heaven with him for eternity. Amen. Here's how Paul describes our Jesus. He says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all of creation together. Christ is the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he's the first in everything. For God in his fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through him God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything on heaven and on earth by the means of Christ's blood on the cross. This includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now, yet now, he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in the physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence. You are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. But But you must continue to believe this truth. Stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. Church, you have heard the good news this morning. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's do it again. He is risen. Yeah. Stand firm in this truth. Stand firm in this truth. Church, stand firm in this truth. He is risen. He is risen indeed. If you don't know who this Jesus is, he is the son of God and he came for you. He came to die for you. He came to take on everything you've ever done and he put it on the cross for you, for you. Because of him, there's gonna be a day There's going to be a day when you stand before God. And if you have placed your faith in him, you will be blameless. Because of him, you will be blameless. Nothing, you will be clean. I don't want you to leave here this morning without knowing him. Don't leave here without placing your belief in him. I'm going to pray a prayer. So I want every head to be bowed right now. If this is you and you are ready to receive Jesus, you you know that he went to the cross for you and you want to spend eternity with him. And you're ready to receive him. Would you just raise your hand this morning? All the heads are going to be bowed. Just raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Don't leave here unchanged. Just raise your hand. I see you. I want to pray with you. I want to pray for you. Thank you. Praise God. Praise God. 
If you raised your hand, repeat this prayer with me. Jesus, I believe you went to the cross for me. I believe you rose again three days later. Today, I place my faith in you forever. I want to be in eternity with you. That's all there is to it, friends. You are now a believer. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. So, Heavenly Father, we just give you praise and glory and adoration. We are beyond grateful that you sent your one and only Son to come to die for us so we could be blameless. We give you praise. We give you thanksgiving. We give you our lives. May we be as devoted as Mary and follow you the rest of our days. May we let the world know what we have witnessed. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Would you please stand with us as we respond in worship?
give the Savior some praise this morning.
the little children, all the children of the world. That means me, that means Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Yes, Jesus loves me. Oh, yes, Jesus loves me. that they are loved by Jesus this morning. Let's celebrate the good news. And now church, may this Easter day bring resurrection to your life and to your home. May it bring renewal and radiate through you. May revival, it, revival emulate through you. May dawn be replaced by darkness and winter be replaced by spring in your life. May the God of all hope fill you with peace and with joy and with hope this Easter Sunday. May you overflow with the power of our risen Lord. Amen. We hope you join us next week. Have an amazing day celebrating our Lord.